Welcome to the latest edition of Cage Side Speaks. My name is 14 Fitzpatrick, and, well, we're in the middle of May, and that means it's post-WrestleMania season. And the first post-WrestleMania pay-per-view that happened this past Sunday is WWE Payback. You might note on the title screen down here that today's title is of the Of Mice and Monsters edition of the show. This is a literacy reference to of the novel Of Mice and Men. <laughs> Except Braun Strowman is no man, he is monster. So is Alexa Bliss, who's also monster. <laughs> anyway... Monsters aside, we have brought here with us today, because this is the gimmick here on Cage Side Speaks, where we bring together folks from the Cage Side Seats community to talk about the show. All three people on this particular edition are making their second appearance. First up is Greco Roman Guy. And then and, and delivered, ready to go. Let's do this. Yep. <laughs> also making his second appearance and returning from the WWE UK Championship Speaks is Keith Harris. Hi. Hmm. Well, uh, that's because I'm not at the uh, WWE UK shows this weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coolness. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. The WWE is actually doing shows in the UK right now. <laughs> yeah, they're running, they're running right <laughs> as we speak. So, oh. <laughs> that, like, there's a picture up of Jim Smallman talking to the crowd in the ring that was taken maybe about half an hour ago. So, <laughs> that that's quite interesting, the relationship between uh, WWE and Progress. Mm -hmm. But thank you for taking the time out of your a busy schedule to join us once again for Speaks. <laughs> And finally, a person who was actually at WWE Payback, Our Lady Justice. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> I don't know if that, yeah, whatever. I'm a little hoarse from last night, so if I sound stupid and act stupid, I'm, it's early for me compared to everybody else. Yes. So, hi. <laughs> and she was at APW's Cow Palace show yesterday, so that's why she's hoarse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> from booing and cheering and... Uh, <laughs> being on how long was that show <laughs> um i think it was like about four hours oh so, man. four hours <laughs> of yelling at the cow palace good yeah. gracious it was it was a big show i mean the, the the final thing was um cody rhodes versus joey ryan in a steel cage which they had oh to oh my god which they had to like put together and to which took a while too it was it was pretty great there was a lot of there was a lot of um like Cody's wife Brandy um, interrupted, and Candice LeRae was there, and she interrupted too. She was like in a little stardust mask and like, like, <laughs> jumped into the cage. It was pretty good. It's pretty good, but um, that wasn't actually my favorite match of the night. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, I'm I'm super ugly sounding, but I'm here. I'm here because I promised Fizzy I would be. Because I was at Payback. Yeah, this this was actually a very interesting show, and uh, so did I know that Dia watched the pre-show because she was at the arena. But did you, did Greco or Keith, did you guys watch the pre-show? Hmm. You know, um, oh, I'll let you go first, Keith. Uh, well, I I I watched maybe the first second half live. And as I was doing the show, just before the show, I watched the Enzo and Kaz match. Oh. <laughs> and that's all you got about the Enzo and Kaz match? Well, I mean, I didn't watch it myself, mostly because I'm never really big on getting into the pre-show because, as always, pay-per-views are long enough, and it starts feeling like a homework assignment if I have to sit down for like four to five hours watching a stream. I'll, I'll maybe let it slide with WrestleMania, but no, unfortunately, I did not catch the pre-show. I did catch the Enzo cast versus the club match, though. Ah, hmm. and it was pretty standard, right? Hmm. I laughed. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's like, it's it's a shame because it was literally, I would just say, uh, like you said, standard. C, fair, nothing that really got me out of my seat, nothing that really made me disappointed. But the only disappointment I kind of feel is that, like, does anyone else feel that the the club and then Enzo and Big Cast are basically just in holding patterns at this point? I mean, like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really know what we're doing with them anymore. Like, 
are the club going to be with Finn? Are they, are they going to go with AJ? Are they just going to be like obnoxious jock bullies? I just don't know. And it's like, because of that, I really can't find myself getting in those friends on cast too. Yeah. So you, yeah, you know, you have ambivalence about Enzo and Cass and the club, you know. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <coughs> so uh, do you have the same ambivalence about the club, Keith? Mm. Um, I think I think um, that they're, they're a team that could really do with either being paired with Finn or, or paired with AJ. I think, you know, uh, they're much more effective as a group with AJ than a tag team on their own. And they, both them and Enzo and Cavs seem like two teams that could have benefited from a change of scenery uh, moving to SmackDown, but other teams got that instead. So they're, they're I do, don't know what they'll, they're, they'll, they'll do with either team. I think, Eventually, I, I guess the um, the club will have matches with the Hardy Hardy Boys over the title, but Which Enzo and Kaz, classic. yeah, that, those should be really good matches. But Enzo and Kaz, they seem to be pigeonholed as the number two babyface team behind uh, the Hardys, which is a is a tough position to be in, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that, Matt. It's just like help too because Enzo still kind of sucks as a wrestler. Mm-hmm. So you know, when you all you're left is a gimmick, and it's a gimmick that's gotten watered down just from overexposure. It's like you said, they literally are just pigeonholed in as the number two babyface tag team behind the Hardys. Are you kidding me? Nobody <laughs> is going to get over the Hardys. Nobody, not even now. It's like there's a reason why Jeff Hardy was nearly going to be like the face of the company like 10 years ago. Those two guys are amazing. I'm going to I'm going to stop myself there cuz I cannot wait to talk about the Hardys more later in the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, from a live experience, what were your thoughts on the pre-show match, Dia? Um it was Look, okay, I'm not gonna lie. There were a couple like it looked like shit in person. Like it, I, like I actually watched it. I like I went on the network and I watched the pre-show and to see how it looked because people seem to have a much higher opinion of the show um, that watched the show than that were at the show. And I was in the second row, so like um, facing the camera, and it's gross because I can see myself most of the time, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but um, it it was. Like the it just the moves looked super sloppy and there was something that there was something some moved I think it was when Anderson had prevented um, Enzo from tagging Big Cass but everybody thought he'd tagged but he didn't and I started howling with laughter because it was the stupidest funniest thing I'd ever seen because it looked like somebody just fucked up it was hilarious but um, it was boring it was I could not care less about about Enzo and Kath. Like I used to really enjoy them and I kind of used to get a little bit irritated that they never won the titles, but now I kind of like, don't, 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 don't give, don't give it to them. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly care less if I, if actually I could, I would love it if I didn't have to hear S A W F T ever again, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, I do think that, I do think that they are super under like mis- mishandling under utilizing I don't know how you would want to put it um but whatever they're doing with Anderson and Gallows is is garbage because I think that they're capable of so much more and we're just not being able to see it and they've just it's like they don't know what they're it's like yeah I don't think they know what they're doing with with them and they know what they're doing with Enzo and Cass they're there for mouthpieces honestly until Cass can go off and be his own giant and Enzo can be like, I don't know, because he's not very good in the ring, let's be honest. I agree with that, with what Michael was saying about that. And isn't that kind of problematic, too, because it's it's been a, a long time, and, like, the sports analogies I always like to use is, like, with, uh, with quarterbacks and pitchers, once they hit 30 years of age, like, you no longer are really allowed to talk about potential because they basically are who they are. And I think mm-hmm. at this, I think at this stage in the game, a similar thing can be applied to Enzo. Like he is a great talker. He's got a great look, but mm-hmm. he really is not a good wrestler. Like I feel that when he splits away from Cass, if they ever split them up, 
he would be wise to be like a valet or a manager, like a Jimmy Mouth of the South heart kind of guy. He would but be awesome tried, in that role. Yeah, he'd be awesome in that role. Mm-hmm. But if he tries to go as a singles wrestler too, nobody's going to buy it if he wins feuds because he's not that good. And if he keeps losing all the time, nobody's going to care anymore because he, he won't have any heat. So it's like mouthpieces at this point. It's a shame because they have a very limited role. And Anderson and Gallows are an awful lot of wasted potential right now. Like, the Bullet Club was awesome. The club is just sort of, eh, and that's not good. Yep. Hmm. I mean, I mean, for me, I'm a little bit more, what to call it? I'm not the biggest fan of the Bullet Club concept as a whole. And, you know, just the gimmick has just aggravated me for the last several years because just of how they do the whole too sweet thing. They do this, they do that. I'm like, dudes, I'm here for the guys that are the native wrestlers from Japan. I'm not here for you guys. No offense. Just, you know, work a good match. (laughs) Try not to be too annoying. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (sighs) But yeah, I, I know that 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 is a that is definitely a minority opinion because there are people who really like the, the the Bullet Club gimmick, although they now have like seventy million members at this point, so it's kind of hard to tell who exactly is in this thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, but then again, there's I guess that's a reason why they've differentiated the club with the Bullet Club because uh, again, it's a, it's it's almost like late stage NWO. Nobody knows just how many people are in it. And nobody knows just how many pieces there are to it. So that's when almost I, not worth having as a conversation. Yeah, when I need a graphical stat sheet to uh, see how many people are actually in your stable, that's <laughs> <laughs> with graphs and lines and who joined when and who did this and who's <laughs> left and this. <laughs> You've got a problem with your stable. Uh-huh. Just just a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So these next two wrestlers aren't in any current stable at this point in time, but it was the match that opened uh, payback. Kevin Owens versus Chris Jericho for the United States Championship with the stipulation that if Jericho won the belt, he'd be transferred to SmackDown. Hmm. Okay, so Keith, what were your thoughts on this match? I thought this was a good way to open the show. Um, I think I particularly liked the finish of the match, which was built around the spot at WrestleMania where um, Kevin Owens used his finger to break up a pinfall attempt and Jericho attacked his hand and that that played into the finish because Owens couldn't use the pop-up powerbomb. And I think, clearly, I think... uh, I think clearly everyone thought that Owens was going to win because everyone knew that Jericho was going to head off to uh, be a pop star again or or (laughs) pop star for, for, let's say, half a year or so, you know, over the summer. So they decided to swerve everyone by having Jericho win and then lose two, two nights later. And you can... Debate whether I think on the night, you know, for for a way to start off the show, it was good to have a baby face, big baby face win that people weren't expecting coming. But whether that hurt Owens a bit, whether whether as a character, whether he needed to lose to Jericho is another 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 thing. See, I thought that they were actually going to swerve us, that they were going to have Jericho win the belt at Payback, and then two nights later in SmackDown, Owens could just destroy him, because that's that's a modus operati for Kevin Owens, is that if he loses a shiny thing, he is going to get it back, or he's going to face somebody else and destroy them. That's pretty standard Kevin Owens, to be honest. Yep. So much yeah. for a prize fighter, more like a big old bully, mm-hmm. which, is, which is not a bad character to play. Um... I love that match. I thought it was a great curtain jerker, just like just like Keith. I'm kind of glad that you noticed that whole work in the finger and work in the hand routine, which was a nice continuation from WrestleMania. I love long term feuds that sort of have that build upon continuity like that. Like the classic example of like the R V D Jerry Lynn matches from ECW where like they would start having counters to their counters to their reversals and then counter reversals. 
I mean, like, obviously, Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho, great performers that they are, are not athletic freaks like Jerry Lynn and RVD were in their prime. But that sort of continuity between the two of them was really great. And I just got to say, those two were magic together over the course of their feud. And their, like, their partnership, the festival of friendship. Like, Kevin Owens brought out the best of Chris Jericho. And Chris Jericho brought out the best of Kevin Owens. And it's just, it's sad to see Chris going because you know that from, this is probably the last great run that he's got in him because he's getting closer and closer to 50 uh, where basically all physical abilities will disappear. He might come (laughs) back with one great run or two, but this was probably his last great hurrah. And if it was, well, damn, it was fun to watch and a great match too. Yeah, I mean, that that was really, it was, Kevin Owens seems to have been the only person on this roster who understands how to work with Chris Jericho. Because <laughs> <laughs> even though Chris claims to be like the Swiss army knife of professional wrestlers. Well, he's the man of a thousand and four holds after all. You got to get it right, dude. Sure, but I think (laughs) at times, and I think Keith would agree with me, he has a habit of overextending his reach. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, I think I I, I thought the his matches with AJ Styles were good, but I think that was partly you know even in those matches, Jericho was trying to keep up with him, Styles, rather than working within his limits at say 45 and i think those matches were good because styles could sort of cover for him a little bit when when things when he when things went a bit off you know well aj styles could have a good match with a couch so you're yeah. i think you're right with that like you know if you can't have a good match with aj styles there's probably something wrong, but I I agree with you. I even remember the WrestleMania match between Styles and Jericho where it just sort of felt like Jericho's mind and soul wanted to keep up with AJ fast and quick, but his body just simply could not do it. And with uh, Kevin Owens, I think what made that whole storyline between the two of them work is that Kevin Owens really understands the, the, the storyline narrative nature of professional wrestling. And like, if that's what needs to take the forefront over the physical ability, then that's what they're going to do. And that's kind of what they did with him and uh, Jericho. And you have a really, really good mid card feud, which is the kind of thing that we're always craving for because we're sick of listening about Roman Reigns, etc. every single night. <laughs> For those of you who are keeping score, that is the first Roman Reigns thing of the night. Put that down on your little counter right there. God bless it. I didn't, <laughs> didn't, realize, didn't realize that there was a counter. I'm probably going probably gonna to break the counter by the end of the podcast. <laughs> well, there is a Roman Reigns match on I, that we got to talk about. So, I mean, obviously that's going to be. I'm, I'm going to hold off. I'm going to hold off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Dia, what were your thoughts on this uh, uh, match? I actually really enjoyed that um, this match. I, I thought that it would be the opener, and it was because I was like, well, they got to have it. They have to have something that people are going to be interested in, right? And everybody loves that. And it was a good match in person. Um, I will say that I was cheering for Kevin Owens, <laughs> which oh. I know you're supposed to boo, but, like, I love Kevin Owens. I think he does amazing work. Um, even when people are kind of down on him for being kind of like the sidekick to Jericho during their big, like, BFF stage. Um, I still thought he was doing better than a lot of other people, and I, I'm just I'm a very big fan of his. So um, the match, <clears throat> I was I was I was I, you know what I wasn't I wasn't thinking that they were gonna swerve us. I was totally thinking that, you know well here's what makes sense. Although you know what I should have known. I should have known because I was like logic dictates that Kevin Owens retained. Therefore, WWE will not go the, that way. You know, like they don't follow logic most of the time. The only logic they follow is my logic because I'm Vince McMahon. That's a pretty good one, actually. (laughs) Thank you very much. Although I think I think I heard reports that Vince wasn't actually at Payback. It was not. He was not at Payback. (laughs) (laughs) He wasn't at Payback. He didn't want to travel. It was too far. Yeah, three thousand miles too far for him. What else? 
I'm resisting the temptation to do a Vince voice for the third time. So, <laughs> um, it was fun. It was a fun match, though. I really enjoyed it, and um, I was totally disappointed by the ending because I don't like to watch Kevin Owens lose, which is terrible because I love heels, and so I watch them lose all the time. <laughs> Wrestling is such disappointment for me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, what was our next match? Our next match was actually a heel retaining against the babyface. Oh, I've cheered the babyface here. <laughs> <laughs> I love Austin Aries because he's not really a he's not really a babyface to me. Austin Aries, he's kind of a he's kind of a dick, and it's obvious. It's I mean to me, it's like super clear that he's um he's just. Well, with a nickname like the greatest man in the world or the greatest man that ever lived, you, you're you not going to have somebody who's terribly humble and like the classic well, baby. Totally. Totally. But I mean, I still, I, I cheer for him because I, I love him. I think he looks like a miniature Satan and that appeals to me on every level. I just think that's awesome. So, it's the beard, and I like his it? wrestling too. It's the beard. Huh? It's the beard, isn't it? It's a little, it's a little like you know, devil like, right? And he's so teeny. Oh, he's so tiny. Like I thought he was a little bit bigger in person, but no, he's not. He's actually like the littlest. He's so itsy bitsy. He's not as itsy bitsy as Alexa Bliss though. Mm -hmm. But he's well, nobody's as itsy bitsy as that. I'm mm -hmm. taller than her, and I'm really short. Oh it's, god, she's so itsy bitsy. <laughs> Anyways, but but no, that was an awesome match to watch in person. I thought actually, I think that was probably my second favorite match of the night it was it was a lot of fun to watch and um and you know i actually didn't know if they were going to finish getting the ring like purpled out for the cruiserweight match because everybody was out there when they were still doing it and i was like how are they not how is that god how is this going to look on tv because <laughs> they're just still out here taping up this purple shit on these robes and um but it was a great it was anyways back to the match it was good i enjoyed it um i feel like the ending was kind of crap, even though I know they don't want to take the belt off of Neville. I still think that, you know, it was just a cheap way to get Aries to not make Aries look bad for not for like losing two times in a row. So, I mean, whatever. I, I still wanted Aries to win, like a proper win, not like DQ wins garbage. Mm -hmm. Anyways, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, this this was a very interesting match, and uh, so uh, Keith, what were your thoughts on it? Well, I I enjoyed it when I watched it, but I think the only thing that stands out, say, you know, a week later is the finish, which you know was a sour note to you know to a what what had been a fun, entertaining match. That, mm -hmm. But it, it's sort of like I don't know the finish sort of came out of nowhere. They would, didn't really build to it. It's sort of like, I don't know, they had their hands handcuffed a bit by this <coughs> uh, DQ finish that mm -hmm. didn't really play into any part of their storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they didn't really tease it very well either. I mean, if they had, if they had done it where both wrestlers had accidentally gotten a... Uh, a, a run afoul of the referee, then it would have worked, but they didn't. They just did it uh, at the very end there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, continue. <laughs> no, sorry. I was just like, eh, I guess. I mean, like, I think my biggest concern with this match was as good as it was, because Austin Aries and Neville are great performers kind of like what we're sort of dancing around here is that we're kind of running out of reasonable outcomes for a feud match between the two of them. Like that sort of DQ finish is it's okay now, but the next time that they meet has probably got to be the definitive ender of the mm -hmm. feud. It has to be because if they stretch it any longer, it's going to have a diminishing return of heat for both Neville, who I think has been amazing since he turned heel and Austin, who has done a fantastic job of getting himself over as that sort of like cocky, arrogant jackass that you don't really want to cheer, but he's just so funny that you can't help but laugh. Like if they go at this for too long, it's not going to be as entertaining. So great match, slightly frustrating finish. They better wrap it up at their next pay-per-view match. Like, story and <clears throat> send them on to the next thing because otherwise it's just not worth it and you know i can see why they actually like i mean 
I agree with you, and that's and it's another thing that that I found. You know, that's why it was disappointing. Like like Keith said that you know that they went with this kind of bizarre ending, but you know just to keep keep the feud alive, I guess. But um, you know, the thing about Austin Aries is that. People were actually, you know, I've watched a lot of the pay-per-views on, on television and people don't really seem to give a crap that much about the cruiser rates. At least the crowd doesn't. People care about, I seem to care about Austin Aries. At least they did at the pay-per-view. Like people were, are all around me. were totally making noise the whole time, cheering for this, that, and the other, booing and what have you. And and it's like kind of nice to see that that there's a reaction. And so I can I can see why they'd want to string that feud out a little bit longer. But but yeah, you're right. It's got it's got to end sometime in the next the next pay per view has got to be it. It's got to be over. What is it? Extreme Rules. That's as good as any to end it on. Mm -hmm. I think Aries is helped by being presented as a star in NXT. So mm -hmm. um, so I think you know he 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 comes across as a a bit more of a bigger deal than maybe the other cruise weights that have just either been thrown on to Raw or maybe were just focused on during the Cruiserweight tournament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's often that's often the peril of uh, when you focus on the, the people who have won in a tournament, you're like, okay, uh, who el who, what else could these people do? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, hi, my name is X wrestler. I have this vignette here and this is what I do this is my gimmick this is my character and uh, this is what I can do in the ring and uh, the, the the big problem is is that we have talked about this before that there is the, the tr issues of transitioning people from these tournaments and NXT over onto the main roster and uh, that's always seemingly been a problem for the creative team uh -huh. to do. <laughs> Well, I think part of that is, too, um, it is a difficulty for the creative team, but never forget, especially these days, at the end of the day, the creative team might be the writers of the show, but I, Vince McMahon, am the editor of the show. <laughs> the editor who wasn't even at this show. <laughs> right. You need to um, you need to start doing a, uh, a uh, count of how many times he, he hits the Vince McMahon voice. I believe we are, we're at yeah. Three. <laughs> or three. So, so just keep up, keep up that count. Do a little mark on the side. <laughs> well, I got it set. But, but all joking aside, <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I've always been like, I don't give the writers of the show that much of a hard time. I mean, like, yeah, some of them come up with really stupid ideas, like that interview that Kevin Eck did a couple of days ago that R squared Circle was sharing around, where it's like five gimmicks that he pitched that got rejected. And I read these, and some of them were like just really kind of dumb, but also cheesy in that wrestling sort of sense. But I don't really blame the writers as much because would you want to work for a boss as capricious as Vince McMahon? I don't think I would because his whims seem to change depending on literally what his last thought was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also you have to consider everybody else in the room. You have all the agents who are former professional wrestlers. Mm -hmm. You have Triple mm -hmm. H, who's very set in his ways when it comes to what he wants. Mm -hmm. You know, he will adjust better than Vince, but it takes him a he little bit of convincing. Say. Yeah. Like, let's not pretend that Triple H is a super enlightened guy. He's got a, like, <clears throat> as much as it's been great that he sort of redeemed himself, I suppose, in the after the reign of terror. Let's never forget that uh, Triple H's exemplar of what a great match should be should be like one of those 35-minute super drawn-out Ric Flair-style NWA matches where like everything has to feel epic. Oh, everything like that has to be really last year at Rumble 32? It nearly put me to sleep. Yeah. I mean, like, that's... Exactly. Terrible. Terrible. I mean, like, and that's the kind of thing, too, is like he's set in his way, like that's what a main event match should look like. It should look like a Ric Flair style kind of match, even if it doesn't fit the story. Like, I still think the best main event match of Triple H's career that best fits in with him is probably when he and Shawn Michaels were beating the snot out of each other at SummerSlam, the first match that Shawn Michaels had, had back after his back surgery. Because it's like, 
that fit the story perfectly. Triple H was despicable. Shawn Michaels wasn't quite clear that he could handle a regular wrestling match. So they do an unsanctioned match, and Triple H gets to be a complete another jerk. But then last year, where they were basically doing the to get Roman over, he's trying to do the whole like, you know, collarable tie ups and you know holds and reversals. And I'm like. The whole story you've been telling for the past couple of weeks is that Triple H and Roman Reigns cannot be in the same room together without trying to kill each other. You guys should have had, as soon as the bell rang, you two should have flown into each other and started throwing punches like it's Shibata versus Ishii. So it's like mm -hmm. automatically the feel is wrong. So it's like, I love it. I think he's a great talent scout. I think that he's a good mediating influence on some of the bad ideas that sometimes come down the pike. Mm -hmm. But I would not trust Triple H to play on my main event matches, especially if he's involved. So it's mm -hmm. like, that's it. That's my big complaint with him. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so after the uh, the uh, confusing DQ finish of the Cruiserweight match, we then had a really stiff tag team match between the Hardy Boys and Cesaro and Sheamus. And yeah. uh, I was a bit, I, I said this on my own show, I was very uncomfortable with this match. Mm. You know, and looking back at it again, I'm like, oh, wow, this was a lot more vicious than it needed to be. Especially, Greco mentioned Kazuyori Shibata. Yep. He's in the hospital right now because he had a <laughs> subdural hemorrhoidema in his head when he did a massive headbutt on Kazuyori uh, on the Kazuka Akata. Mm -hmm. And he now has paralysis, temporary paralysis on the right side of his body. He still can't really feel anything in the right side of his body. The possibility that he won't wrestle again is there. He well, certainly mm -hmm. won't. Mm -hmm. They had to remove a piece of his skull to redu reduce the swelling. Mm -hmm. And in light of a match like that, in light of the main event match that happened in New Japan, why do you do a viciously stiff match with the 40-something-year-old Hardys and 39-year-old Seamus and Cesaro. I, I just kind of don't understand that. Uh, so, Dia, what were your thoughts on this match? That tooth popped out right in front of me. Like, that was, like, right in front of me. I was like, that was his tooth. No, that was not gum. That was his, that was his tooth. And then later, yeah, it was, in fact, it was his tooth. It was... <clears throat> It was pretty pretty awesome, and then the like ref just like picked it up and put it in his pocket, like it was just nothing. I was like, he just put that tooth in his pocket. Anyways, um, this was not as brutal in person. Like, I mean, I'm gonna say like you could kind of like hear some of the the you you, you kind of like see a little bit more when you're like right there up close, and you it's it wasn't as terrifying in person, except for the tooth popping out because that was that was legit. I mean, that was that was brutal. Um. I thought that uh, I think that it was okay though to have that kind of a brutal match. Like, I mean, I'm not to disagree with you, but a little bit, I'm gonna disagree with you because I I've seen you know I watched the broken mat thing when it was when he was just doing like indie shows and stuff, and he seemed to be pretty inclined to want to like push limits because you know it's just like, hey, I'm still doing this, I'm still here, blah 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 blah, and um, I think that that's something that they probably all wanted to say is like let's give them something that's like hard hitting to show that we're you know we're still kicking it pretty good and we're not just like holy shit Seamus is 39 years old you know like I didn't even like like people I don't think really think of that he, he actually he looks pretty good for for 39 and I mean compared to some of the other people who are the same age like Brock and and um John Cena and uh who else is 39 um Titus AJ Styles AJ, he, I mean, Seamus, Seamus is uh, aged quite well, and he still seems like he's not slowed down too much, but he, it's his style, so, I mean, he's a bruiser sort of guy, he's a brawler sort of guy, so he's gonna, there, you know, and, and Cesaro and him seem to be clicking really, really well as a team, and so I think, I think that the, that the brutality of the match was all right, I wasn't as, and like I said, in person, it wasn't as it wasn't as harsh to watch. I mean, they they weren't, except for except for of course the tooth going flying everywhere. Like that was that was pretty cool. But I mean, I mean, no, no, that was that was really hard. Uh, but there wasn't any blood. There was like no blood anywhere. Except, despite a tooth except being at the end, right where up. then they turn and Matt got a slightly bloody forehead. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, but I meant when the like I don't know if I knocked a tooth out, I feel like there would be blood all over the place, but there wasn't. So that was why at first I was like, is that gum? No, that's a tooth. But um, it was a good match to me. I I enjoyed it. I actually loved the turn at the end. I was like, yes, because I've been waiting for them to to go to go a little rogue, at least in between. They're so enjoyable. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people thought that the whole Seamus Cesaro tag team was just like, okay, this is a temporary who cares sort of thing. But I think it's really worked out for both of them. Mm -hmm. Cesaro, I love him so much, but he is, to me, much better when he's in a tag team. Like, I don't really enjoy him that much as a single star so much as I do when he's a in a tag team. I just think that's really his best role. Mm -hmm. So... Keith, what were your thoughts on this match? Um, I think I think the stiffness in the match probably played into the turn at the end. You know, so I could see why you know maybe you know they worked a bit stiffer, like Sheamus um, in the match because they knew that he was going to turn heel at the end. And I would also think that. Um, Although it was stiff, I don't. It didn't look particularly dangerous. I mean, obviously, you know, sometimes you'll have an errant shot if you're working stiff, and that may cause like a tooth to fall loose or something <laughs> like that. But it's not like the sort of the sort of skull on skull headbutts that are really worrying like in New Japan, which can cause serious brain trauma. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, I wouldn't wouldn't really want to compare compare the two. But I thought the turn was probably one of the best things on the show. It was executed very well. And I think it, you know, I think it was the right move for Seamus and Cesaro's career to I think they've got good chemistry together as a team but I think they'll probably work better as a heel unit mm -hmm. yeah I mean I can understand that it's basically apples and oranges comparing Okada Shibata and this tag match but at the same time it's that that show was only a few weeks you know uh, before payback and I'm like it's just the concept of doing this kind of match after something so serious had happened. It just made me like go, yeah, that 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 just didn't sit well with me. Mm. I think if uh, I think WWE probably have stricter limits on their performers that you know in terms of what they can and can't do. That I I'd be be sort of surprised if there was a similar incident in WWE as to what happened to Shibata. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, performers do get concussions, they do get serious uh, concussions, but usually they're, they're accidents, they're not caused by uh, purposely striking each other hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... and that that the the that headbutt incident in particular that was just a pure reactionatory you know strike he didn't realize that he was going to hit him that hard it was just it was just at that moment he was running on pure instinct and just hit him in the head too hard you know shibata hit okada too hard and i'm surprised okada didn't get severely injured from that spot mm. yeah and you know well, the thing is um and i'm because I'm a huge uh, New Japan mark, and I watch an awful lot of it. And uh, Okada is probably one of my favorite wrestlers on the planet. And Shibata was a, he was a. But I'm I'm mixed on Shibata. The thing is, is that it feels like in this conversation we're focusing an awful lot on that key headbutt from Shibata to Okada, the one where the blood started pouring down his forehead, and he looked like the coolest, baddest, toughest man to walk on God's green earth, but. As I'm sure we all know, like that's not the only time that Shibata has done those stupid headbutts with uh, other matches. Like he does it in tag matches, he does it in other pay per views. The famous headbutt, the one that always freaked me out the most, was when he and Ishii were fighting each other. I think it was at Wrestle Kingdom 10, and they headbutt each other three times in a row. And after the third headbutt, they sort of like staggered back, and you could see Shibata's eyes rolled back into his head. And at the time, 
I was saying things like, that doesn't look like he's selling. That that looks like he is legitimately, legitimately feeling it. And it's like, how do I put this? The thing that it comes to Shibata style, strong style wrestling is that there are certain types of strong style wrestling, I think, that are just stupid because they don't allow for something to be built upon. And that's the same thing that Tadahashi has always uh, insulted Shibata for. It's like, yeah, Shibata goes in and beats the snot out of somebody and headbutts them a couple of times, but what's next? What what can you feasibly do next that isn't like ridiculously stupid? And I think that Shibata kind of accelerated his bump card. You know, like you've only got a finite number of hits that you can take in your life, and not all bump cards are created equal. And Shibata... His style, if he just subtracted the headbutts, I think he'd be fine. Yeah. And he paid the price. And so going to this uh, this Hardys versus Sheamus Cesaro match, it's like it's not nearly as ghastly to watch as like some really hardcore New Japan matches because like you guys have said, mm-hmm. WWE doesn't allow for that crap. They never they won't in the aftermath of what happened with Chris Benoit, and they won't in the aftermath of Daniel Bryan. They simply won't. They'll find other ways to exhibit strong style, but not of that regard. I really liked this match, especially the ending, because to me, and I might be just wishful thinking here, that could be a catalyst for us to get broken Matt Hardy in WWE. I mean, if you guys have been watching his Twitter yeah. uh, feeds ever mm-hmm, since, mm-hmm. he has become far more familiarly, shall we say, sesquipedalian with his choice of words. Like his, <laughs> his, his insult, as I use a word that broken Matt Hardy himself might use later on, his response to Dawson, I think it was, he's like, excuse me, I don't hearing you with your mouth wired shut you obsolete mule and i was just like yes <laughs> because <clears throat> it was a it was a stiff match um that's kind of what you get when you have sheamus in the ring i think it was good moving forward for both teams but again i don't want to see a, an entire card of matches like that because that would make me feel a little bit sick to my stomach. It's like if I wanted to watch guys legitimately trying to fight and beat each other up, I just watch UFC. Mm-hmm. I want there mm-hmm. to be I want there to be at least some degree of like play pretend worked action to my fighting and not just legitimately smacking people. But it was a good match for what it was. And I like the turn at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed the turn at the end. I really liked the fact that basically, you know, they did the handshake and then it was like and gotcha. the funny thing was is that Shazaro instigated this. <laughs> Up until at this point, it had been like Seamus who was kind of instigating that we should kick them in the face. <laughs> but it was Cesaro who threw Jeff Hardy and then Seamus proceeded to kick Matt in the face. Yeah. It was good. Mm-hmm. It means that Sheamus was always like secretly influencing Cesaro and not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Although, <laughs> if I was if I was Sheamus and Cesaro, however, I would probably be watching my back because they would not want to be rendered obsolete. It's not the obsolete Hardys of Doctor Frankenfurter and Igor that I would be worried about. Six weeks, kids. Six weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're coming back. I'm counting down the days. I miss them very much. Mm-hmm. Yes, six weeks until Seamus and Cesaro don't have legs anymore because the revival will be coming back. <laughs> oh, man. Good stuff. I really so- wanted to see the revival fighting Seamus and Cesaro, though, because, like, the revival is so much smaller. Like, I don't know, like, do you, like, if people really recognize just how much bigger Cesaro and Seamus are than a lot of other people, they're both, like, like six foot, I think five and six, and and like they're two hundred and sixty plus pounds or so. I mean, they're big dudes. Like the revival's like two twenty and like five ten. Yeah. So I mean, they're itty bitty, and I would love to see those two teams like clash against each other because I think that would be awesome. But whatever, that's just me. Well, yeah, it's like it's weird to think like sometimes you don't quite realize just how big your typical WWE wrestler is. Because I actually had a chance to, like, I don't want to say I met him, but I sort of bumped into Seamus when he was on campus uh, last year when I was at my senior year of college. Uh, It was like, I can't remember, like Notre Dame versus Wake Forest or something like that. He was there because he'd given a speech to Notre Dame, and he was decked out in all Notre Dame apparel because, of course, Irish to Irish. But the thing that my buddy and I could not get over was just how darn 
big he was. He was monstrous. And we're just, we just look at each other and then we met, made eye contact with him. And the look on our face was kind of like, you know, we clearly know who you are, but we're not going to be obnoxious about it. And so he just sort of looks at us and does that whole head nod like, yeah, I know it's me. Nice that you guys recognize that. Smiles and walks <laughs> off. So it was kind of cool, but he was giant. So yeah, like the revival, they're going to get over by being, by being the revival, which is the most lovable, hateable tag team ever. They're the best. Yes. They are the best. And, and something, <laughs> uh, something that I think is underrated about the revival is that the revival <laughs> is actually sort of a modern inter- interpretation of eighties Southern tag teams. Oh, absolutely. And, the biggest okay. difference is is that the typical 80s Southern tag team, usually they're like really smart about wrestling, but they're not that bright. Bash and <laughs> Dawson are incredibly intelligent. Especially oh, so Dawson. Smart. So smart. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a referee ref in a revival match? It'd be so frustrating because they are always trying to push the envelope with the rules. Mm-hmm. They're so good, though, with the referees, though. Oh, I mean, totally. you know, like... Like, that's one of the things that, like, you know, they cheat, but their blatant cheating is so slick. And it's so, it's so like, seamless. And when they're distracting the refs, it's not, like, super de- unbelievable where you're just like, come on, are you, like, this ref can't be this stupid. You know, like, I, that's, that's kind of the problem that I've had with a lot of WWE matches, like, on the main roster, is that the refs always seem to be just idiots. I'm like, how are you this stupid? Like, this is actually taking me out of the match because you are this dumb. I really just can't even like actually to go back to the Austin Aries and, and Neville match like that, that ref, I was literally like, are you an idiot? Because <laughs> like, you, it just seems so out of nowhere. And I just, I oh, can't, okay, I can't deal with that. That bothers me anyways, but that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think that it was sort of it was sort of early to have this kind of, of stiff match after that, but you know that that's just me. Mm. But I, I enjoyed the match, you know. Besides the the battering ram from the second row, which kind of made me a little uncomfortable because basically Sheamus dropped Matt like a sack of potatoes, and the whole accidental kick of Jeff Hardy's uh, face, which knocked out a tooth. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which could have gone so much worse, but thankfully it was just a two. Yes. And speaking of monsters, before the next match, there was a Braun Strowman promo, which basically Braun compared Roman to a wounded animal, and that was an awesome, awesome promo. The thing I loved about it, though, was it immediately segues to the other monster on this show. Uh. (laughs) The tiny pixie hulk? Yep. (laughs) Alexa Bliss. <laughs> oh my goodness! And uh, this was the women's Raw Women's Championship match because, for those of you who have not been paying attention to the WWE programming lately, they did a superstar shakeup, and which caused a bunch of people to be traded to two different brands. On the women's division front, Alexa Bliss and Mickey James got traded to Raw in exchange for Charlotte and Tamina Snuka. Hmm. And so Alexa has resumed her feud with Bailey from her NXT days, and this was also in Bailey's hometown of San Jose, California. Well, it wasn't exactly the best hometown coming for Bailey. I have a brilliant idea. I'm going to book the baby face to lose in her hometown. <laughs> I'm a genius, damn it. <laughs> are we oh are we God. not sure that this wasn't a Triple H idea? Because he has a tendency of putting himself over the hometown talent as yeah, well. <laughs> it didn't. It actually that that match sucked the air out of the room um, when Bailey lost, and I don't think that it got quite the 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 heat on Alexa that I think they were hoping for by having her beat Bailey in her hometown. Most of us were just kind of like, oh, okay, that that's unfortunate. That really sucks. That sucks, and that's that was literally we weren't like boo, you horrible bitch, you totally like ruined our. Sh-. Now we we're just like oh well, okay, mm-hmm. I guess. It's like it's like how Jim Cornette described like when the Undertaker streak was broken. Like I'm sure he's he's like, I'm sure that they expected the crowd to go nuclear um, when the Undertaker lost, but instead everyone was just like, oh, 
it's sort of like, you know, just like a sad sort of like, that's not what we wanted, but it's also not a kind of like building upon hatred. It's just a sort of disappointment. And that's the worst kind of thing. And that's basically what happened. I mean, like I said, I was right there. There was a little girl who was sitting, like, I think about a row or two behind me, but almost directly behind me. And she kept yelling out all through the match, I love you, Bailey. I love you, Bailey. And then at the end, uh, when it was over, I, it was so quiet. I could hear her, like, kind of crying. Bailey lost. Yeah, it was pretty sad. I felt really bad for that girl. Every single little girl who was a Bailey fan in that arena learned how to swear that day. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> it was like it wasn't a bad match all in all because it wasn't it was actually not very good in person. Like I was super bored by it. It was like you could why like I was watching Bailey drag Alexa to spots and stuff and it was just like oh what? the hits like the the it just it for, in person it did not look good. But I think it it probably looks a lot better on TV. Everybody else seemed to love it. TV. <laughs> And I, but then again, I do kind of see what you mean. Like, I would say that perhaps one reason too why Bailey is so over too as a baby face, especially with live crowds, is uh, she is like one of those workers who can figure out a way, much like Kevin Owens with Chris Jericho, to get a good match out of people who might not be on her level. Like, she's very good at sort of working with people. Like, she managed to get a great match out of Eva Marie at NXT. She's gotten decent matches out of Nia Jax, and. Uh, Alexa Bliss, for all of her great character work, and she's certainly most improved, she's not a great wrestler. And mm -hmm. it's like, she's good, but she's not great. And I'm kind of getting a little bit sick of her. Just just a little bit. I mean, like, I want her... I don't. It's not the kind of, like, change the channel sick of her. Not that okay. at all. So, like, we're still in the good <laughs> stage here. I just want to see her lose and lose in such a humiliatingly bad fashion. Like literally nothing she tries works. Maybe in a couple of weeks I'll get my wish when Asuka comes up and chokes her unconscious, but that's just wishful <laughs> thinking right now. Yeah. Now she's probably going to get it. I bet, I bet Asuka goes to SmackDown. Probably. They'll put all their, put all their beautiful <laughs> Japanese people on, on SmackDown. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but you know, it's, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but again, I don't really think that it was the best idea to have Bailey lose it in her hometown. Like, I get the the logic to such a decision, but the execution did not go as they hoped. It never does. I don't know why they keep doing it because it never does. It only just like 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 when when Sasha lost in Boston, everybody was just like, oh. You know, every time it happens, every time they should they should have learned by now. It doesn't mm -hmm. work like it used to. You just stop making the baby faces lose in their hometowns because it makes the crowds like it literally sucks the life out of them. They're just like, okay, I'm sad now. I'm not angry. I'm sad. And they and they think that that is going to work because this match was very much in a 1980s style WWF match. I noticed, and uh, you know. Uh, I thought it was good. I did notice some of the missed spots. I did notice, uh, you know, that, that that Bailey was basically carrying Alexa. But I did like I did like what happened at the end, which was Alexa hit the DDT, and basically she's sort of becoming a female version of Jake the Snake Roberts at this point. Okay, I I, I can see that. I mean, Jake was never the best worker, but he was certainly the best talker. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. But I loved Jake the Snake. Mm -hmm. He was so great. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Keith. So, anyway, Keith, what were your thoughts on this match? I, I thought it was, a, it was a good match. It seemed to have a lot more energy and the crowd were more into it until until the finish. I think the, the problem with the finish, it was you had the heel win in the hometown, but she didn't really cheat or anything it seemed it you know i know that bailey was thrown into the ring post sort of but that it came across more of as more of a, an accident rather than a heel cheating to screw mm -hmm. the baby face out of the title so i think that the finish didn't really work for getting the crowd to boo it just led to a uh, flat flat finish and 
it's sort of they had a similar finish at WrestleMania with Sasha Banks and Charlotte, where Sasha Banks went into the I think was it the exposed turnbuckle or something like that, and that came off very flat as well. So, um, but I think I think this match also shows that twenty years on after Montreal and Vince McMahon isn't isn't over it yet. <laughs> neither is the clique, neither is the hearts, neither is anybody involved in that particular match. Because, like, I seem to be one of the few people in wrestling today who just simply does not care about the Montreal screw job. I don't care about how they did this or that or the other thing. I'm interested in the history of it. I'm interested in, like, what when Beyond the Mat did their documentary, which was right at on the day of the screw job when they did their filming. I'm like, okay, th this is interesting. This is weird. This is uh, legitimate, obviously, because the whole the whole domino effect, uh, you know, the whole butterfly effect that happened with Brett's contract, Sean being Sean, and everything else that happened. <laughs> Brett being Brett. Don't forget that Brett, and even he'll be the first to admit that he <clears throat> was not exactly the most adult behaving in that situation. Of course he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He's a heart. Touche. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the hearts acting like actual people and adults is like that. That's that's when pigs start flying in the sky, Greco. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to them, but I understand wrestling families. They just mm -hmm. really don't understand what what is considered what is considered normal in wrestling culture is not necessarily considered normal in the real world. Mm. Well, you know, wrestling families are always their own biggest marks. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're they're their own they're their own biggest enemy in in a way. And it, it is it is sad to see that, but you know, at the same time, that, that whole mess just was like a tornado of epic proportions. Right, Keith? Mm. Yeah, I think I think my point is though, I think I don't think they want someone to keep I don't know, get too big a star in their hometown because then that may give them leverage or something or or you have to deal with like like it's similar to see probably the only person who's become a really big star in their hometown uh to a noticeable degree would be CM Punk in Chicago oh, and every yeah. time they go back to mm -hmm. Chicago now they have to do deal with the CM Punk chants and things like that so I don't know if that plays into the mentality of yeah you, regularly beating baby faces in their hometown because they don't they they don't want them to become such heroes to that extent in their hometown that they have these issues with i don't know talent not wanting to lose in their hometowns or you know or getting so over in their hometowns that if they leave the company then it becomes a problem with chance i don't know but I think that that could play into it a bit, as well as trying to get a heel reaction from the crowd in the audience. That is indeed a very, very good point. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's incredibly petty, but I bet you that that's probably a possibility there, that they're like, you know, we never, ever, 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 ever want anyone to be bigger than the company itself. And if they're too big in a region, we'll do what we can to remind that region to know your role, know your place, and shut your mouth. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you cannot, you cannot possibly shut up a Chicagoan, though. So uh... <laughs> I, I would know. My, my dad's from that area. So, and yet, ironically enough, he's as mild as a glass of water. So I guess he missed the memo on how to behave as a Chicagoan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the same with any of the other big cities, Dallas, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York, you know, they're, they're not going to listen to the whims of a crazy man from the middle of nowhere in Connecticut, which admittedly is also the richest place in Connecticut, but they don't care. <laughs> nope. Mm -hmm. mm. You're a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. We're the big city. <laughs> <laughs> Something like yeah. that. <laughs> and speaking of of the middle of nowhere, um, our next match happened in a lovely one story house with a attic. It was, had a room of creepy dolls. It had a self riding tractor, 
It had a light system that could turn from blue to red, signaling the beginning or ending of a match. It also has a fully functional kitchen that does need a little bit of TLC. It's the <laughs> house of fun. I mean, horrors match between <laughs> Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt. And oh boy, our panel has quite a lot of things to say about this one. Uh, who <laughs> uh, I'll start. I'll yeah. start. Go, so, go first, Greco. <laughs> so just to get my piece out of the way, this is not necessarily something that I've come up with, but it was something that when I saw it, I was like, yeah, I absolutely agree with this. And that is that the, the idea of a Randy Orton match is often way better than the actual match itself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that Randy Orton is his, just his very style is his own worst enemy. Like Randy Orton is so smooth and fluid in what he does that it often looks like he's not trying. Like even if he's really busting his ass, it still doesn't look like he's putting in an effort. But then when he's not putting in an effort, he looks like he's going in slow motion. And that's like the old general thing that I have a problem with Randy. It's like he's got to be a psychotic heel. Because otherwise he's just too boring to me. But again, like the WrestleMania match kind of sucked the wind out of this feud because it was just so overbooked, stupid. And I was watching this and I'm like, you know, for all of Vince's uh, crapping on WCW, I'm wondering just how many Dungeon of Doom episodes he was watching in preparation for the House of Horrors (laughs) match. Because this felt like this felt like something right out of the Taskmaster trying to destroy Hulkamania. All that was missing was Randy Orton turning on the faucet, sticking his hand in the water and pulling it back and going, ah, it's not hot. What is this place? Like, it was just, it's an interesting concept, but on paper, but sometimes you, you need to like actually say your ideas out loud. I feel like this is something that was written in a script. People read it and they're like, yeah, that's awesome. But if you'd actually sat down and table read it, you'd be like, wait, this is just stupid. And they, I, I'm curious. Like, There are reports that the crowd was chanting boring during this entire film. Um, thing. Is that true? About, about two-thirds of the way through, yes. They started going boring, boring. Cause it, we, were <laughs> like, is super, we, were, we were super like, what the f- is this? this was just, it was so, I don't know. I mean, I assume that it played better for you guys because you could just like no, hear it. Your, but for, but in the audience, you know, we're all like looking at these screens, going, "What is this stupid shit? Why is he wearing no shirt and he's got mm-hmm. pants on?" Randy in pants is dumb, but if you're gonna have him in pants, at least have him put a freaking shirt on. And like, and we're like, "What is? What are we looking at? Like, what is this crap that's happening on the screen?" And I'm like, and they're like in this house, and it's actually actually would be probably a kind of a cool house if it wasn't such a trash heap, but. Um, <laughs> You know, and they kept focusing in on these really creepy dolls, which are awesome, but terrifying. And I got to say that as a Bray Wyatt fan, I was super like, oh, my God. <laughs> Just like, oh, my God. They couldn't have, they couldn't have tried a little bit harder with this. And the actual in-ring that they had in front of us was the dumbest shit ever. Like, like I was sitting in a position where I could see, like, a Randy Orton-shaped person in a hoodie climb under the ring. And I was like, oh, come on. Yeah, like this is mm-hmm. happening. This is happening while that's happening on the, uh, or no, this is happening. This happened a little, little bit later after the next batch, which was kind of a debacle. But, <clears throat> but yeah, it was. It was. Ah, oh, dude, I. What the, what were they thinking? Like I know that they pulled a bunch of like, um, you know, network members or 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 whatever. There's somebody that they pulled a bunch of of fans on. What would you like to see in the House of Horror movies? I mean, idea. I mean, Matt. A terrible idea. You cannot. And a lot of them that. said, "I need to start in an actual house." And lo and behold, it started in an actual house. And I was like, "Oh man!" Mm-hmm. All right. I almost this is dumb. I almost wonder. My slight conspiratorial nature on this is triggered a little bit. I almost wonder if they did that. Just so that Vince could say to all of us that this is what happens when you idiots are allowed to run the asylum. When I give you what you want, it's terrible. Only <laughs> I, only I know what you want. I think you that wanna... tough enough is uh, is can can attribute to. I mean, can can say that that like that's evidence enough. Like, haven't they like all but gotten rid of like the, the winner group except for I think um, Amanda, and then they kept like 
a bunch of people who were kicked off earlier in the show because the people who were chosen as the winners like have not panned out and they were chosen by who us well not by me i voted for other people but <laughs> yeah yeah, no, it's just it's just bad. I just I give this a, a, like a solid D minus, almost an F, <laughs> because it's like you know this again. It goes back to what I said. The idea of a Randy Orton match is sadly far superior to the actual execution. But I'm just curious, like what you guys thought, because I don't want to say anymore because I'm going to start raging. It was just bad. Oh, <laughs> F, bad. What about you, Keith? You ain't said nothing. I, I I think it it was a match that took itself far too seriously. <laughs> with lots of stupid shit in it and i think you know you you i i think if you're going to do this you 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 had to either uh, keep it just either just do an ordinary match in a house just keep it as a gritty brawl or go completely other the other way and have lots like run-ins and stuff like that crazy shit happening and it sort of fell in in the middle really you know so you know so you know it, it, i i think it was it was taking itself too seriously which was the problem and you had this sort of plodding brawl in between you know sort of long lengthy shots of like the you know doll doll's house and you know Orton stalking his prey and it just went on for too long. And I think if they were going to do a brawl in a house, I think they should have like bought the house for like thirty thousand dollars or whatever it was up for <laughs> and just completely wreck the place. You know, and have like this mental brawl that everyone would remember and i think it was clear that they they just wanted to rent the place they didn't want to spend all that money so they they had to do a brawl while not damaging the house too much i mean I they kind of missed the memo there because they broke a section of wall and orton was crushed by a refrigerator <laughs> i actually had a friend last who told me who went to the show with me last night who said like, they actually enjoyed the match, which I thought was hilarious. But they were like, but God, I really wish that Randy Orton had just stayed under the refrigerator forever. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> Whoops. And, but, you know, yeah, no, that might have improved things if he had, if that had just been it. And, you know, Randy Orton, he is fridge dead. for life. He, he is dead. <laughs> well, not dead. Well, you know what I mean, though. Mm -hmm. Kayfabe yeah. dead. Faux dead. Just sort of like the giant in that Halloween Havoc uh, pay-per-view all those years ago where, like, he's in a monster, monster falls truck, falls off the building, crashes, and then somehow shows up later that night for a terrible match. <laughs> mm -hmm. Once again, for all of Vince's knocking on WCW, I feel like that's where he got his inspiration here. <laughs> who, who says it wasn't just Vince? Because you know Triple H actually worked for WCW for a brief time as well. <laughs> yes, it was a... Uh, a very terrorizing uh, time in his life. <laughs> so bad. Uh, it was. It was horrible. It was a house of horrible. Mm -hmm. I honestly, really, I've said this before, but like, I really, really like wacky matches like this, and this one was <laughs> was one of my one of my personal favorites of of the evening. Just this idea of. Okay, we're already in Bizarro Land because Orton has taken Satan's limo and has arrived in <laughs> pants <laughs> to I a mean, House of Horrors match. <laughs> and it's decided to brawl with Bray Wyatt, who is wearing a white shirt. Mm. Okay, never now we're played. having more Bizarro World antics because Bray has never wore a, a white shirt before. He wears white pants. Yeah. Not the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> and that's confident to wear white pants. I'm sorry, but it is. Yep. But you've got Bray in a white shirt, Randy in pants, and they're brawling inside of a house of horrors. Damaged the section of wall, got crushed by a refrigerator with the Wyatt logo on the front of it. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, dirtiest fridge in imagination land. Just mm -hmm. awful. Cut. <laughs> Like, I enjoyed the goofiness. I enjoyed the uh, fact that Bray actually knows how to uh, command a limo driver. 
<laughs> didn't even have to like commandeer the thing. He only just said, "Driver, take me to the arena." <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, what about the uh, the actual in ring portion at the end? Did you 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 were you were down with that too? Even though it was a an epic just cluster of nonsense with everybody interfering, like that's that was some overbooked craziness. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it it led to Bray winning a feud for once. Yeah. Well, okay, I appreciate that because he loses weight too much for my taste. But mm-hmm. but gender mania happened, and uh... <laughs> I don't know. Did you guys gender? Does it did it show up on the on the TV that everybody was chanting gender gender? Did that show up? Did y'all I believe hear that? It, I believe it did. I didn't notice it, but it might have happened. And oh just yeah, no, there was a lot it. of people actually <laughs> at the end were chanting gender gender gender, and I was like, holy crap, are they? This is ironic. They're being ironic. Mm-hmm. Are you <laughs> sure? <laughs> are you sure? Maybe they're just doing it yeah. to get under Randy's skin. Oh wait, that that is being ironic. Never mind. A lot of yeah, a lot of the people around in my area were just they were drunk as shit. They were so <laughs> drunk, <laughs> and they were all like, they, I mean, like I I had I had referred to them somewhere as drunken and hardcore dude bros, and that's really that that's <laughs> a very accurate um, description of all the people in the like area where I was. They were just they were drunk. They were like they thought they were like badasses, and they all looked like they were probably in college and. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, those people, those are not my people. I'm sorry. Dude, the snake man lost to the creepy cult, bro. Not bad. No, it, was, not bad. It, was more, it was more like, you know, the kind who like show off their like, like, oh, that wasn't like, like that wasn't as good as, as, you know, some name, some other match that oh, happened God. in some like oh. indie territory that I don't recall off the top so of my head. So you're by know. a bunch of drunk wrestling hipsters. You poor That's thing. what I said. Like, like, <laughs> like hardcore, hardcore dude bros. I mean, it was horrible. I was like, oh, go burn yourselves. I just, uh, <laughs> whatever. Anyways, um, but no, that match was it was just not impressive in person. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> and I love Bray Wyatt, but I just I was just like, oh god, this was horrible, mm-hmm. just horrible. Ugh. So, uh, Keith, what are your thoughts on the whole gender push thing? Hmm. I well, I I haven't seen enough of say I haven't been watching SmackDown, so I don't know how how the presentation is. I I just know the presentation like before wrestlemania i think the 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 issue there was was just like how nondescript a role he had that it's very difficult to just flip the switch and uh put him in a world title match and get everyone to to buy into him and also i found find jinder mahal very boring (laughs) <laughs> as a as the wrestler, I think in the ring he's you know I I don't think you could probably match two wrestlers up in WWE that would you would think would have a more boring match than Randy Orton and Jinder Mahal, which oh, I think God. is you know that's the issue here. I think it seems like from the running that Mahal is developing his character and. You know, I think so, but I'm not sure whether character is enough to carry, let's say, a 15 or 20 minute main event. But I think having Jinder Mahal do the run in and cost Randy Orton the match was the right thing to do because they need to heat Mahal up a lot for him to be taken seriously as a, um, you know, as a headliner on the next WWE pay per view. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was a that was a smart strategy. I mean, I've been a fan of Jinder Mahal for years, folks, and so I've in, I'm enjoying the fact that he's getting a push, and I might be in like the the small small minority that is actually enjoying this whole push well, thing. I'm enjoying it too. Yeah, it's it's it's, mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. funny because it's so damn ridiculous. It's like it came out of nowhere, mm-hmm. but Jinder, to his credit, is absolutely just full blown diving into this appreciate that like he is not like unsure of himself or worried he's just like i'm i'm the guy you know and it's just like i can appreciate that uh misplaced but confidence all the same i appreciate the fact that at least it's not 
the same group. It's somebody new. It's somebody. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not somebody from the same well of like the little baggie of people that they carry around. You know, like who are we gonna have? Oh, here on this slip of paper, let's do Roman Reigns and Randy Orton or whatever. You know, I mean, that's obviously they're on different shows, so it wouldn't happen. But at least it's not the same people. It, gen gender is different, you know, and maybe he's not like the most brilliant of choices, but maybe he is, you know, and he's, he's just, he's a different kind of dude. And I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. You don't know if someone will work out until you give them the opportunity. And they're, mm -hmm. at the, you know, a lot of people, they don't really give a proper opportunity to, to be in that top position, but at least it seems like Jinder Mahal is, uh, has been given the ball and he's being allowed to either uh, score a touchdown or fumble. Yeah, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, you know, in in the next few months and how how that pans out. I mean, yeah, I mean, like for instance, progress does that sometimes, right, Keith? Hmm. Um, well, I think I think progress. Um, I think. Well, I think progress is interesting at the moment because, um, you know, there, there are definitely wrestlers that are pushing very hard who aren't connecting with the audience. So there's uh, James Drake, who, you know, people will be familiar with from the WWE UK tournament that they've been pushing really hard and giving given an unbeaten streak to, and they're pushing Flash Morgan Webster hard since his comeback to injury. But they don't seem to be connecting at the level uh, with the audience to their push. And so, I mean, but then, you know, the, you know they also, though, they can see that, you know, fans are organically getting behind someone and then give them a bigger push. So, for example, Jack Sexsmith would be the the example of that. So, so you can get a bit of both at the moment with progress. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more of the current progress champion. You know, mm. just he we kind of went from sort of a backmarker mid card guy to just this absolutely despicable diabolical individual who you know will do anything to keep that belt mm. who's, who's the progress champ right now pete dunn oh god fuck that guy <laughs> <laughs> so well i i probably look at it differently so in the sense that pete dunn was pushed harder by revolution pro wrestling so revolution pro wrestling um which is one of the other big london promotions they had pushed him pushed him really hard as their cruiserweight champion early in the year to build to a big match to against will osprey which he which he lost in but i think everyone all a lot of people a lot of my friends uh, thought that at that point so this would be a few months before um few months before he got the progress title that revolution pro wrestling should have had him uh beat osprey for the title so he was already uh getting maybe pushed harder in other uk promotions so i think him becoming the the champion wasn't really as as much of a surprise to to uh, British fans. I mean, I think for British fans, he was probably one of the most obvious people in progress to to give the ball to and make champion because he had shown that he could carry it, carry being say a headliner in other independent promotions in the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but to to an Amer to an American audience, I think he was kind of an unknown. But that he's just raised his profile so significantly since the UK tournament, and him having yeah. the title in progress as well has really helped his his stake. Yeah, I think I think I think I think progress. Well, at least the friends of mine who are progress fans, I think you know it, it's sort of a weird dynamic because you've got Pete Dunne and Trent and Tyler being heels, 
but then the promotion are in bed with WWE. So it creates a really weird dynamic. And, and, and this is that, you know, it, it's hard to suspend your disbelief. And, and I think people are enjoying, you know, uh, you know the British Strong Style storyline, but it's sort of where is it going? And, it, you know, there's a lot of comedy in the matches playing off there. Yeah, you know, WWE. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Triple H based comedy in their matches, which doesn't quite work for a main event feel. So it's, I mean, you know, progress are in, at an interesting crossroads, I think, as at the moment as a promotion, as their relationship with WWE develops. I think. So basically, British Strong Style are doing Bullet Club like antics in. <clears throat> main event matches now yeah they have like so you've had them doing doing the triple h water spit during the matches all three of them you've had them teasing doing pedigrees and things like that so which you know so so which i don't know it i don't know if it it really helps them it may it probably you know it probably it's more funny than like uh, villains you hate sort of thing. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you get that? I mean, like I can understand it because, you know, Progress did have sort of a false villain in Marty Scroll hey, as their champion before. That guy. There is nothing false about that villain. That dude is my favorite heel just because he is so despicable. I God just... bless you. I love him too. <laughs> no, I don't love him. I love watching I bad things happen to him because he. You know, so I love bad. him mm -hmm. because I love him because he's so bad. Like the more like horrible shit he does, I'm like, I love you more. I mm -hmm. love you more. Be better. Mm -hmm. Be I, more gross, and I love you. I still periodically just to like be evil because I think he's rubbing off on me. Uh, I'm good buddies <laughs> with uh, with Mike Abelson, who contributes to Cage Side a little bit. Did that great uh, story on David Starr a couple of days ago, and I sent him the the video of uh, Battle of Los Angeles 2016, I think it was, where Marty Skrull had Mark Andrews in the finger break spot, and uh, Mike responded by basically cursing me out for forcing him to think about that. It is the most simple yet disgustingly mean heel spot ever. And I love Marty Skrull for it, mm -hmm. but I also love seeing him get killed. So it's weird. It's like, I love him, but I hate him. With Pete Dunne, I just hate him. <laughs> but yeah, like you went from Skrull to Skrull getting murdered by Jimmy Havoc, because that happens <laughs> in progress, <laughs> to, you know, to Dunne being the champion. But it's interesting that we're making Triple H comparisons because the next match on this list has a guy who is essentially doing a mini Triple H thing, even though he's been separated from Triple H in his evil staple for months now. And that would be Mr. Seth Rollins. He managed to have a really bad match with Samoa Joe, unfortunately. So... Ooh, the, I hate uh, Seth Rollins. I booed his ass at that match. I cheered Joe. Fuck Seth Rollins. He can go. He can also burn like the rest of those losers that were around me, all in their shitty Seth Rollins t shirts. Oh, yeah, I'm in front of you. Oh, and it all comes out just why you hated them. You hated them because Seth Rollins is essentially their avatar. He, he is treated and supposed to be a good guy, yet there is nothing good nor sympathetic about him. And I'll he never is, forgive him. Uh, I'll never the chair shot, the, the betrayal. Never forgive until I hear the words out. Like you can tag team and shit all you want, but until I hear him actually apologize to Dean and Roman's faces and have them say, "Okay, I forgive you," until I hear that, he can he can just fuck off forever. And that's how I feel about Seth Rollins. Mm -hmm. Too because like I just. I don't buy Seth as a face. I don't even buy him as that cool face, like the anti-hero baby face, because okay. he just, what is it? Like there, there are certain people that are just very good at projecting a certain type of persona, even if that isn't who they actually are. Smarmy. With, with Seth, yeah, with Seth, it's like this Desi. smarmy, naturally prickish demeanor. Like mm -hmm. it just, it doesn't feel like a cool, tough guy anti-hero, like Roman Reigns could be. Instead, it just feels like a slimy, greasy rat. I mean, like, there's a reason why yes. 
there's a reason why people make fun of him by calling him Sith Rollins or Traitor Face. It's like he's he, he does not engender sympathy. And Joe Samoa Joe is well. First off, he's the first guy I ever bought a wrestling T-shirt for the the first black one that he had when he came to NXT. He's he's like one of my favorite wrestlers because the dude is like an even more legit Kevin Owens that like he is just there to fuck people up. Mm. And my favorite wrestling match of all time is and always shall be him and Kenta Kobashi trying to kill each other for ROH, which is, if you can find it, must watch that match. So it's like, automatically, I'm supposed to root for Seth, and I'm supposed to hate Joe, but because of their personas, I can't. I mean, and also, why exactly is Joe taking orders from Triple H if he even really... What is his motivation here? What's he, what's he doing other than just pestering Seth? He would be in it NXT be purgatory. Insane. He'd be in an in NXT purgatory forever if he didn't do it. And what Triple H says, that is that is my current belief. <laughs> That's my current belief as to why he's doing anything that Triple H says or otherwise. Oh, uh, you're having... uh, gonna be uh, facing Seth, uh, or you're gonna be against Nakamura for a for the billionth time. time. Oh my god. god. That's my best Triple H there. I think I need to stick to Vince. Yeah, stick to Vince. That sounded <laughs> a little more Vince-ish. That sounded like Triple H trying to be Vince, actually. Well, he kind of is, isn't he? To yeah, I guess. To an extent, yeah. I, I've just spent the last two minutes muted my microphone because I was laughing hysterically. Because normally I'm the guy who's viciously beating Seth Rollins to a, a verbal pulp. <laughs> mm-hmm. Instead, it yeah, was Greco <laughs> and Our Lady Justice. Keep what were your thoughts on this match? Well, I mute my microphone again because I got another laughing fit coming. I, I, well, I, I, I thought the match was fine. I think though it's very telling that you know Seth Rollins supposedly you know has come off the biggest victory of his career, beating Triple H at WrestleMania, and he's just dead as a character. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this match came across as a just another match on the show. It didn't come across as particularly important. And mm-hmm. I think partly that's on Seth, and I think partly that's on how Samoa Joe has been presented. He's He's mm-hmm. been presented well. He's been presented as a tough guy, but he hasn't really been presented as an absolute, killer monster it is sort of the push has just been like um a shade below that so it's not like i mean it's not like i think it, he came into this match with a big undefeated streak and he'd absolutely destroyed everyone in his path and Seth was the first big name he was going against it's sort of like you know, he he he's been winning a lot and convincingly, but he doesn't look like a completely kick-ass, uh, you know, monster that that's, you know. So it, it's sort of, um, you know, I thought it, the match was fine, but it felt like it should have been a lot more impactful and meaningful than it was, and you know. I think this is one of the weaknesses with having maybe Brock Lesnar as champion. If this was mm-hmm. the match for the world title belt, then it would have come across as being more important than just a mid-card match. And still you would have people screaming about it because of Seth's inability to sell and Joe's advancing age. But you know, I, I do see your point there, Keith. They'd, they'd still be hating it, honestly. I, I, I didn't know that everyone was hated on this match. I mean, it was the most I, boring match of all. Like personally, like sitting there, it was it was on par with the women's match for me personally for being just really boring. And so I felt absolutely no no qualms whatsoever at going boo. You suck, Seth. I said that's the <laughs> only negative thing I said to a a face character all night was was you suck, Seth. I said that in front of children, but that was it. That was the only bad thing I said. Wow. I think it was, I think it was, (laughs) I think it was very similar in a lot of ways to the Seth Rollins Triple H match at 
WrestleMania in the fact that... That bored me too. Yeah, I mean, it was psychologically, it was very sound. You had Samoa Joe working over the leg and then uh, Seth Rollins eventually making the comeback. But, you know, I think if you uh, don't connect to the character and don't find him sympathetic and you're not rooting for him then that that can be a very boring match to watch if you're if you're not into the characters invested in the baby face who's trying to overcome the odds overcome the what odds, odds? <laughs> what no i'm sorry i was about to make like a that sounds like a job for the big dog but you know we should, <laughs> let's save that for the next one i mean it's like you're not wrong keith like Technically yeah, no. speaking, this is a fine match. It's just like this is, and it goes back to like what I said earlier in the show. It's the the narrative nature of professional wrestling needs to be in sync with the actual performance itself. And if Seth Rollins was not such damaged goods as a babyface, so to speak, and I and I don't want you to think it's like he's irreparable because he can certainly be fixed as a character. The problem is, is just that. I don't really think they know what type of face they want him to be. Do they want him to be like the, the creative guy? Do they want, what is his character? Like, don't just tell me he's the architect. Is this, is this Prove the it. Roman Reigns argument? No. What is his character? What is his character? Cause that's all I heard for like the longest time. What is his character? And now I'm like, I mean, I don't know about that. so maybe, maybe this is their thing is they don't know what they want character wise out of most of their people the ones that they totally leave alone those are the ones who stay the truest to their characters i think like i can't imagine anybody really writing much for bray wyatt because he yeah. seems to handle himself and he's even if he is booked like garbage he his character is still like true to itself which I think is really And good. I think it's also going on that point. I think it's kind of unacceptable that WWE kind of hit the jackpot with, with the Shield, which were three fantastic performers together as one of the best tag team stables in, in I think, the company's history. Uh, we can mm -hmm. definitely see that with several years away from when they split. But the fact that as it currently stands, two-thirds of the Shield, we have fans wondering, what is their current character? Like, that's unacceptable. You should know by now. Like, you should have an idea. Like, Dean Ambrose, I totally know who he is. Dude just doesn't give a fuck. Like, I that still is. I don't like him, though. <laughs> well, it's like, that's okay, but you at least know who he is. Like, with, with Roman mm -hmm. and Seth, we don't really know. And so, when we don't know, we're left to just sort of. We can't get invested. If we can't get invested, what is the first uh, instinct of a wrestling fan? To hate or to creatively go after them. And I am. I got to stop now because I cannot wait to talk about this next match and everything that leads up to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the one more thing about the Joe Rollins match is that we do have to talk about there was the botched finish <clears throat> with Joe yeah, getting his hand up right oh, at yeah. the free count. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that shoulder. We, we were sitting right there. I was like, his shoulders are not down. And then they're like three. And I was like, hey, wait. Hey, wait, that's bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, no, his shoulders are definitely not down. Mm -hmm. so, I, think yeah, that's a, I think that's a tough finish to pull off, though. The the sort of the you know choke with the shoulders down finish. I think that's quite. I think that's an easy finish to get wrong, just because uh, it's not. I, I don't know whether it's instinctively you wouldn't normally do that because obviously you wouldn't want to pin yourself. And so, but it, it just felt, felt to me like that's a finish that could quite easily go wrong. Oh yeah, definitely could easily go wrong there. But just like, it was just the, the cherry on top of this Rollins-Joe match, which in any other situation would have been like the second or third match on the card, but for some reason it was the second to last match on this show. Just really bonkers card placement on this particular match. <laughs> I think though, like, you know, as I was saying, like Seth is coming off like, you know, beating uh, Triple H at WrestleMania. So obviously they're going to position him high on the card as a consequence, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think they, I think they that they were that they actually had put him high on the card even before the Triple H match, correct? 
Uh, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, but I think he's definitely someone who the higher ups see as someone who who should always be in a in a strong position. So I think if he's not as a baby face, he's like. I think clearly slotted in the number two position behind Roman Reigns. And closely followed by Finn Balor at this point. Mm. And Finn's and, great too. See, I'm so bored of Finn Balor. <laughs> I find <laughs> him really super boring. I'm sorry, everybody. I like saw him and all I could think is like, you have nice abs and that's about <laughs> it. I'm, like, I'm just, I, I, I don't find him particularly charming. I don't care about the entrance and, and I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I, I find his matches like really like samey, samey when I watch them. Like they all seem kind of the same. And I don't know if that's that's probably weird, but I don't know. I just, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. I'm sorry, everybody. Just not a big don't fan. worry. It's we're all friends here, even if your opinion's wrong. No, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Like it is true that exactly have the greatest of characters. He's just sort of a pretty to look at and uh very smooth and crisp in the ring but and a very fun entrance but i'd like to see him as a heel in wwe i'd like to see him be like you know the guy who's like copped in fucking new japan get the fuck out of here that kind of guy like because it's at least a character right now you're right he's just sort of abs and a cool finisher (laughs) yeah that's about it sorry (laughs) I think, though, in NXT, they were much better with his character development. And I think part of Finn being uh, Finn being a great babyface is that he connects with the audience, with his background. And I think he, he comes across as a really genuine, nice guy. But in WWE, where you have the in-ring promos, that doesn't really come across quite in the sort of real life vignette personality pieces that they did did in NXT where they sort of pull pull you know pull back the curtain a little bit and let you know what the real person is like. Yeah. Although I, I do think they did do two big missteps in his NXT run, which was, of course, first, the never-ending matches and feuds with Samoa Joe and Nakamura, oh. and yeah. also two of his entrances, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre entrance that I think TakeOver Dallas, <laughs> and Jack the Ripper at TakeOver London. Ugh. That was so cool. That was so cool. I know it's like really bad history, and as a history major and a history teacher, it's like, Jack the Ripper at this rate is in all likelihood probably a couple of copycat killers, uh, and we're never going to find out. But just the imagery of the Jack the Ripper entrance was really damn cool. It's like ahistorical, but super cool. But was- I wish we had more of that. I wish we had more of that on the main roster, like Keith said. In NXT, he was just awesome, and he could get away with just being awesome. And in WWE, he needs to be awesome again. How do you do that? Um... That's why I'm not one of the bookers. <laughs> yeah, no idea. I got nothing. I think I, I I think for Finn to be awesome again, probably the best way would be to turn him heel. I think as a because I I think as a speaker, he's you know cutting a baby face promo. He's okay, but I think he needs to be uh, carried a bit like he was in like the Miz TV segment during the pre-show by a more charismatic heel talker and, you know, just get his one-liners in, you know, with Uh pop responses. Well, who knows? I mean, he's going to be allegedly going to be feuding with Bray Wyatt next. Maybe Bray will just bring the demon out and let the demon, like, go and then Finn will be like some I don't know I'm just I'm just speculating speculating here but but that would at least be something interesting kind of like a good a good version of what happened with Randy Orton you know back when it was good do you remember when it was good it was good for a little while it really was it was it was then it wasn't and it was just like (laughs) damn it (laughs) 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally enjoyed the Brandy Bray feud, even when it did get to its sort of what people considered its low points, but like, I'm looking forward to Finn Bray. I think it's going to be very I interesting. Hmm. I am too. I want. I hope that he will be. I. I actually want Bray to also win this feud, but mostly because I think that it would help make changes for Finn. I because I think that that's needed. Mm -hmm. I think that changes. I think Finn definitely needs changes because I'm. I, like I said, he's barely been on right, and I've been a little bit like I don't care that you're back, and that sucks mm -hmm. because you know we should be excited about him, and I mean everybody should, and I'm just like. Eh. Whatever, like, you, you can just, abs, abs, they're abs. <laughs> but I feel that way about like Tony Nice and and Neville and and well, gosh, Neville's abs were amazing up up close. Let me just say, wow, that is those are some like I like that stuff looks like it's not even real. It's so like symmetrical. It's really creepy, but awesome. Mm -hmm. So just saying, abs, woo. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> that might that might be the uh, um, the the subtitle of this podcast. Uh, there's mm -hmm. um, payback and abs. <laughs> Sorry. Well, man. well, we're uh, we're we're getting into the part of the program where we're talking. We're going to be about now. We get to talk about a monster. And someone who basically was squashed like a mice. <laughs> but he's so he was so beautiful in his defeat. Yeah, he was, and uh... no, he no, he wasn't. He got crushed, and it was amazing. It well, was I'm just saying, but but he's still even. You know what? Beat beat the fuck up. Roman Reigns is still better looking than like ninety nine point nine percent of the people in the world. So, mm. like, he looked beautiful in his defeat when he was coughing up blood in the in the uh, uh, ring at the end, and yeah. Yeah, I, I see that. I mean, and I, this is what I was holding back on uh, at the very beginning of the show, and that is that what I was listening to, to, uh, to pump myself up, uh, talking about Braun Strowman versus Roman Reigns was, do you guys know who New Legacy Inc. are? That group of like, to review video games and stuff like that, but they also review shows. And I think I need to like post a link to it on Twitter, but they were doing a reaction to the segment where he managed to delete every human being on the planet by flipping the ambulance and attacking Roman three times. And that was just... Braun Strowman's amazing. He's just so damn good. <laughs> and... From that moment on, I was like, okay, this is great. This is going to be great. But it's also incredibly problematic because Braun Strowman is supposed to be this big monster that everyone's afraid of. Like, he's supposed to be this monster that nobody should cheer. But the problem is, is when you have a guy who is, like, doing a running power slam onto a boombox mic system, and then as the babyface lies on it, the crowd chants, you deserve it. It's like it's amazing, and I loved it. Roman finally has an enemy, but the crowd was uh, pieces of shit. I'm sorry, yeah. I was there. They're garbage, and you know what? That you deserve it. That was that actually got killed pretty quickly, and um, it was really only one section of the crowd that was chanting it, but they happened to be right behind me. Um, and then some other people would pick up on it, but then they would stop pretty quickly. The kids really didn't like it. I can tell you no, honestly. Like, I mean, it was it was gross. It was super gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't. It really wasn't like. And I was actually, especially referring to the um, the raw segment where the crowd was chanting, "You deserve it." I mean, this is the problem with Roman Reigns, the poor guy. Like Vince McMahon has literally now. We can we all agree that he has done literally everything he can could possibly have thought of to get Roman over. Like, what is there left for him to do? Throw a kitchen sink at him. <laughs> well, was that not the Undertaker match? Was that not the kitchen sink? Like, what well, I, literally... I, I understand that... Is like, is it not... I mean, I don't know how true this is or, or anything, but it, it was my understanding that Undertaker actually chose Roman Reigns, not Vince. But 
Okay, so I haven't heard that. I've heard that Roman, uh, I'm sorry, that Undertaker requested Cena and then got turned down. But then I guess after that, he's like, okay, well, I'll do Roman. But the See, thing I, is, it's like... I heard the opposite of that, 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 he, that Vince had wanted Roman. I'm sorry, that Vince had wanted Cena. And Undertaker wanted someone younger, so Vince said, how about Braun Strowman? And then Undertaker said, how about Roman Reigns? Okay. And that's, that's, then, that's and allegedly, then, that's alleged. I don't, obviously, I have no idea if that's true or not. Allegedly, that is and how it goes it back to, and I'm, I'm sure that there's probably some truth to that, but it just sort of ties back into the fact that I feel so bad for Roman Reigns, mm-hmm. the person, because we have now hit the stage where I don't think he can be salvaged as a babyface without like spending years as a heel, because the fans no longer like the, the the fans that don't like him, they're no longer like disliking him because you know they know he's Vince's golden boy and they want to boo against Vince on principle. Now there's like an extra level of anger there that he's the guy that got to retire The Undertaker. Really? Him? And I'm not saying that that's my mindset. Me personally, I was like, if it had to be, do what you must. But it's just, it's problematic, isn't it? That Braun Strowman, who should be treated as like Bane, like this big monstrous genius smart guy who's terrifying and totally unscrupulous, Mm. like he should not get any sympathy here. And yet I could clearly see that the crowd was behind him crushing Roman Reigns at payback. And that's not good. Well, they want the the crowd is bloodthirsty. It's mob mentality, you know. They're in there, and they're just like, you know, you're just like, yeah, give me more violence. Where's the blood and stuff? And it was right. just, you know, like where was the blood in the in the in the House of Horrors match? Like they were crashing through walls. They were being crushed by you know appliances, large appliances. But did you see a speck of blood anywhere? No, you didn't. No, Not a drop. It wasn't even like well lit. You could have. Had you know, so I'm just saying that you know these people are craving, you know, they're craving the violence, and they are feeling validation because it's against specifically Roman Reigns. I'm sure that if he was like beating up, you know, even if he was beating up Finn, I'm, I'm probably he probably would still get some. He wouldn't get the obviously they wouldn't get the you deserve it chance, but you'd probably get like Braun chance at least because Braun's being a badass, and everybody loves it when somebody loses their shit and just starts beating the fuck out of somebody like remember a couple of oh it was it, it was um after roman didn't win at was it tlc or something like that he didn't he what about Sheamus, money in the bank. won at the, oh yeah or, yeah, or, yeah or, that was the Sheamus one where, where then he where he went ape shit on triple h everybody was like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's the violence people get off on that yeah. just and i mean it's it's i'm not saying that it's not um but I'm, but that is definitely at least a part of it, at least from my my opinion. Mm-hmm. So, Keith, what were your thoughts? What are your, what are your thoughts on this whole Roman thing at this point? Hmm. I, I think I look at it a bit differently. I don't see it as a problem at the moment because at least fans aren't apathetic towards Roman Reigns, and I think they would have had have a bigger problem if let's say Seth Rollins was the person they're building around at the moment who isn't passionately hated by the crowd but he isn't passionately loved either he's sort of a bit lukewarm the fans Mm -hmm. generally cheer him but it's not with any great deal of fervor or 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 passion so I I think what, what you know I think what they've learned from John Cena is that you can play both sides of the crowd. So you, you'll you keep pushing Roman Reigns strong as a baby face because that, uh, because that appeals to children. And, you know, it seems like women on the whole are more behind Roman Reigns. It, it seems like... Men, are, you know, it's the male audience that's against Roman Reigns, which was similar to John Cena. Was that John Cena was drawing kids and um, kids and women to the arena, uh, but the male audience, at least, uh, were were booing him. I think that they 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 that worked for ten years. It, um and so they they think that they can do the same thing with roman reigns and i think there's a degree i think of trolling the hardcore 
fans who hate Roman Reigns, just in how he's being presented. I think, you know, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they they had Roman Reigns beat The Undertaker because partly it makes him a bigger star to the more casual fans, to the children, like he's the person who ended The Undertaker's career, but that's also going to rub up the hardcore male fans who think he's been overpushed. So it sort of works both ways in some respects in that it will get him maybe more more looking like a bigger star to kids, but also rubbing up the male fans more so they hate him more. So you get a match which has a really hot reaction. I think this this had the hottest crowd reaction on the show. I think it was also... And that partly was why it was the best match in the show. But I think mm-hmm. you know, it was also very well booked. I think Roman Reigns was very good at sort of sort of dodging and moving and you know, using more speed. And Braun was the uh, unstoppable monster that kept... Uh, kept beating him down, and I think it it, it created a really, really uh, dynamic reaction for the match and for the crowd crowd audience. So uh, I think this worked. I mean, the the issue is, you know, will it work with other opponents? And so I think they've got a really good dynamic now between Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. Uh, um, well, Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman, and obviously Lesnar will eventually face Braun Strowman, and I think that's a really good dynamic. But it's it looks like they want to get to Roman versus Lesnar at WrestleMania, and they need more opponents for the two of them than just Braun Strowman. And I think that's where that's where WWE may be struggling. Uh, for the remainder of the year is to find opponents for Roman Reigns and for Brock Lesnar that can get the dynamic and the reaction that Braun Strowman does at the moment. Hmm. Interesting. It might not even be Lesnar versus Roman at WrestleMania time because we still, or we're only into May, which is the second month, uh, of the uh, of the WrestleMania calendar, and uh, things can change in a heartbeat in WWE land, and uh, we're not sure. Maybe Vince will put put Roman with somebody else, or what? Or Lesnar will ha- disappear again, or some contract issue will happen. You know, you never know yeah. with this company. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think though that that was what was rumored to be the plan. Um, I think it was just before WrestleMania that news came out. And given how they've certainly put hints in that direction with Paul Heyman, you know, after WrestleMania, you know, the pro- promo he cut was uh, targeting mainly Roman Reigns. So that, that they clearly see that as a big match to, to build towards, whether it's at WrestleMania or SummerSlam. But that that's definitely a big program they have in mind, I think. Well, who else? Who else would you have? I mean, who else would you would you would you be interested in um, that you would even think would be on Lesnar's level? Like, imagine if you're you're Lesnar for just a minute. I mean, just sitting there. Who and you look out on the on the W? Is anyone even close to your level? The only one at the, at that exact moment, really, that is even remotely in his orbit is Roman Reigns because none of the others have the have been built up in that superstar to that that level except for Reigns I mean really who else would he have gone after so you know it's Reigns is actually the gateway to bring Strowman into the Brock Lesnar orbit I'm just, I mean yeah. I'm just saying like like that's like that's actually that's actually not not poorly done and you can you can do the same thing and you do the same thing with some other people, you know, you're like, you've also got that, uh, well, Kevin Owens is no longer on the show, but I mean, Finn Balor, he still owed a, uh, you know, a rematch for his title. 
uh, or for the for the universal title. So you can always bring him in at some point. Make make Brock a big bad dude for beating the crap out of this tiny little Irish guy. You know. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying there are there 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 are things that you but you you know you've got to have to you, you know just figure out a way to bring around and and like it or not, I know that a lot of people probably won't care for that. But um, Roman Reigns is like the way to get in. If you want to get to someone big, big, big like Brock Lesnar, you kind of have to go through Roman Reigns first. Yep. Yeah, you you have to totally go. Don't concur with that. Yeah, you have to go for Roman Reigns first, and like, uh, so we've we talked a little bit. We talked about Roman. Uh, so Keith, what are your thoughts on Braun? Hmm. I think he's greatly improved as a performer in the last six, six, nine months or so. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, in the past, you know, I think they've tried to build him up to a level where they can push him as a headliner. And I don't think he was ready for it. You know, I mean, you know, I think he really struggled to have uh, long matches that held the fans' reaction. But I think now he's becoming a much better. I think he's uh, has much greater presence and aura. He knows how to play the monster better. I think he's got maybe more varied offense as well. That I think he's really, really carrying the push that he's been given uh, recently, and he's had two good matches with Roman Reigns in a row on pay per view. And so, uh, you know, uh, probably better than the quality of the main event at WrestleMania with a veteran like Roman Reigns versus The Undertaker probably wasn't as good as the two matches that Braun's had with Roman. So he's really, I think, uh, doing well with the opportunity he's been given. To be fair, The Undertaker's also old as shit, dude. So I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, like we we knew that we were not gonna get a stunning, stunning uh, match out of out of Undertaker. I'm sorry, I, I, you know, years years ago maybe, but now no. And I think that that was as good as a match as we would have gotten out of anyone. And I, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to to Roman Reigns for trying his fucking ass off for to make that as best as he could to honor Undertaker in some way. Yeah, I would. Oh I wow, I didn't know that Braun Strowman's actually older than Roman Reigns. I did not know that. <laughs> I just looked that up because I was curious. He's he's like two years older. I didn't know that. That's pretty amazing. Wow. Anyways, sorry about that. Go on. Go on. <laughs> I I uh, I wasn't like really. I wasn't really completely crapping on the Undertaker. Uh, Roman Reigns match at WrestleMania. I thought it was all right, but you know, it's just the Undertaker didn't have enough gas left in in his tank to do much better than the match they had, which was which was okay, but um, you know, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't going to be the classic match that the Undertaker had in years past with. You know, people like Edge and Shawn Michaels and CM mm -hmm. Punk and people like that because mm -hmm. his body was just too beat up. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame, too. It's like, it is what it is. We all, I I don't, I, it was just sort of sad watching that match because you guys are right. As much as we wanted it to be otherwise, there was nothing left in the tank for Mark Galloway. Like, it is, it was what it was. And I give Roman credit for, you know, like you said, working his ass off to to get the best possible match, but you can only do so much with what you got. So mm -hmm. it's just, I I'm kind of glad though that Braun Strowman is sort of stepping in as the new resident monster of WWE, like Undertaker was in his prime, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's it's just so much fun watching him because he's not just a, a big stupid monster he's also pretty smart like when he decided not to get involved in the roman uh undertaker brock lesnar routine he's like this is not what this is not worth my time i am not going to get myself beat up and so he leaves i'm like wow that's actually pretty smart for your 
resident monster. And then he goes and proves how tough he is in this. And I, I think the future looks bright for him. I think that he has improved impressively and very quickly. And I really can't wait to see what the rest of his career has for him. I agree with you. I think he's definitely come. Like, I remember, like, the rumor, like, early, early, early last year, or maybe it was the year before, about, you know, Braun Strowman, and, you know, he shows up, and then they're going to give him, like, the Undertaker match. Everyone was like, boo, that's the worst yep. idea. He doesn't know what he's doing. And then this year, they're like, why didn't they give the match to Braun instead? You know, cause his, because his stock has risen so high, and I think it, it is a – a lot to do with the caliber of people that he's been working with. I mean, you know, um, even though we can, you know, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, people were all like, Roman Reigns sucks in the ring, but he consistently puts on exceptional matches uh, now. And, and you know, if you're working with somebody who is good, you know, you're going to improve. You're just, you are go going to. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, you know. It's it's good for Braun. It's good for us as wrestling fans because now we've got someone else who we can be like, hey, here's someone who is legit. Let's let's rock. You know, it's awesome. Yeah, and I mean, I, I like and like honestly, I I don't think that I don't think that you said really anything particularly bad about the Roman Undertaker match there, Keith, because like it was what it was. We all understood that Taker did not have anything left in the tank. We all understood that uh, Roman had to literally carry this fifty-year-old guy through this match, and well, admittedly, he did at the end basically take a bazooka to the Undertaker, and uh, <laughs> fans were not happy. Hmm. Well, it wasn't that bad because it kept my attention at um, about 5 a.m. in the morning or whatever time it was here in the UK. Oh my God, like, man. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I, did, I stayed up for WrestleMania. I didn't stay up for payback. I, I sort of watched the first hour and then went to bed. <laughs> so, and then watched it, the rest of it later. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That was for the best, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think that's maybe why I like the Samoa Joe and Seth Rollins match more than maybe other people did. Is that you know I, I was it wasn't like three hours into a show. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you had a you had a break in between there. You saw the first half, which was good, and then you saw the second half, which had some hit or miss stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was way different being live. I remember seeing some tweets from the early on, like, "Oh, they just showed Roman and man, they're just boo." Or they they showed something, and it was so many boos. And I'm like, "We didn't see anything." Like, I'm I'm literally like like anything in the pre-show where you hear the crowds like loudly booing. It was because somebody was standing up and showing their pro Roman sign in the in the crowd, and so the crowd was like, "Boo, Roman Reigns sucks. We don't like him. The, fuck that guy. <laughs> He's crap." But whatever. That's I mean. So so what you guys see on TV, like what what's actually shown on TV versus what what it's like live is so so hugely different. It's not as different on Raw, oddly enough. But like to the Raws I've been to or the Smackdowns I've been to, it's it's actually really not that different. But for some reason, the pay per view. This is actually my first my first pay per view that I was like right there for, and it was pretty. There was a lot of disappointment <laughs> sitting in that crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So let's get our final thoughts before we close out here. Let's start off with Greco. Hmm. Overall, I thought Payback was a that it was a net positive show. Um, there were a couple of bad things and a couple of disappointments. I thought that the House of Horrors was probably the low point of the show for me. Uh, I thought. Roman versus Roman Reigns was definitely the high point. I wish that Seth Rollins versus Samoa Joe had been a little bit better, but overall, it's it was worth my time to watch it. I'm gonna give it a B minus. Okay, cool, Keith. What are your final thoughts? I thought it was a show with a lot of good, uh, not nothing really all that great outside the main event. And then you had the ugly of uh, the uh, Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton match. So I think I would give it a, a B overall as a show. Coolness. Dia, what are your final thoughts? <clears throat> um, it was fine. 
<laughs> I mean, no, it was, you know what? I loved the main event. Um, that's really what I was there for. I thought that was that was that was really good, ex- with the exception of the, that got weird at the end with the crowd. That was that was by far my favorite match. And then, you know, I have to give the cruiserweights their credit because I was very entertained during that match. Love Austin Aries. I think he's awesome. And um, obviously, super sad about the whole. Like, I like Alexa Bliss, but I didn't want her to win that day. Not not that day. Like, she could have won the next night on Raw or something, but I didn't really want to see her win on, you know, with so many little girls crying out for how much they love Bailey. I just, it, it seriously, the whole, like, mood just went super south immediately after that. And then I wanted better for the... The, I wanted better for so much more. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna actually concur with with Greco and say B B minus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I typically I've said this in the past. I have very low expectations for WWE related pay per views, <laughs> and uh, I, I always do because you never know what exactly you're gonna get out of a WWE pay per view, and I it's best to always have something of a moderate to low expectations about anything in in, in whatever fandom that you're in, and uh, I felt that this was a really good show. I was looking forward to it. It really the the categories to make it a really good show for me is at least I need to have at least one good promo segment and three good matches, and this show delivered. The opening match exceeded my expectations. The second match exceeded my expectations. The uh, Braun Strowman promo was amazing. The I was one of the few who really liked the women's championship segment because I'm a really big fan of Alexa Bliss, and uh, having Bailey lose in her own town might not have not necessarily been the best idea, but the promo afterwards that she did was fantastic. Um, the main event was fan- was great. I liked the House of Horrors match, but then again, I love the wacky stuff in professional wrestling. And uh, I like uh, wacky shit too, bro. But come on, <laughs> I, I know, but that, that's that's my thing. And, uh, and the only match that I was really particularly disappointed by was Rollins Joe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that about does it for this edition of Cage Side Speaks. If you would like to hear and. and Here's the thing about me. When I moderate these shows, I typically don't tend to talk a lot. This is a guest first show, in my view. And we had three wonderful guests on here today. And if you would like to hear more of my personal thoughts on the show, I recently revived my old podcast, Vizzy's Wacky World of Wrestling. I do them on Friday afternoons with my current co-host, Sal Cusimano. If you'd like to hear those then, then I will be providing a link uh, down below in the comment threads if you'd like to hear my thoughts with Sal. And thank you so much once again for tuning in to the latest edition of Cage Side Speaks. Thank you so much for tuning in with us because this was a really, really fun show to do with free commentators who really, really know their stuff. And uh, we'll see you in the next edition of Speaks. And I suspect, speaking of Chicago, as we mentioned earlier in the show, I think that's going to be the next show, TakeOver Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I think me and Sean are doing that one. I think we're doing a post-show review show. I don't know. I have to talk to Sean. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> regardless thank you folks for tuning in on, on this sunday or monday whenever you're watching this particular edition of cage side speaks on cagesideseats.com have a great day ladies and gentlemen and we'll see you for the next edition of cage side speaks bye bye adios <laughs>